welcome you all here tonight. Music forward, we transform young lives, we inspire careers, and we champion a more inclusive music industry, and that is why we are here tonight. I started about a year ago with Music Forward. A few weeks after I started, we were at uh, a workshop with uh, 25 young people ages 16 to 20. Half young women, half young men. And there was a question that was asked in the room. And the young men, his hands go up. And because I wasn't facilitating, I was stepped back and I could see this happen. And it hit me how systemic this challenge is and talking to her staff and talking to her mentors, ask the young woman, what do you think? There was no one young woman's hands that went on. We see it in the boardrooms, we see it in the studios, we know the data, and we know that we have to do this together. And so I encourage all of you to get to know these organizations a little bit more, partner with us, sign our mailing list, become a mentor with Music Forward, and let's empower that next generation together. And by a raffle to this night. That will help us all. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Laura Whitmore, who is the founder of Women. She is the producer of the She Rocks Awards. A lot of things going on, right? Oh, writer, a parade, a music writer, parade magazine, singer, songwriter as well. Laura is our moderator tonight. Again, thank you, thank you to all of our panelists. I, am very much looking forward to the conversation that's going to happen tonight on this panel, but also the conversations during the mixer, how we're all going to work together, and how we're going to continue to drive this industry forward together. Thank you. Laura Whitmore, and it is my mission to have these conversations with women in the music industry and to share stories, build community, and provide opportunities for us all to create a greater space for women to thrive in the industry. So, um, before we start, I just want to thank some of our sponsors because we have had great participation with a lot of supporters for this particular event, including, of course, Music Forward Foundation and Live Nation, who provided this space for us today, and the Alliance for Women Film Composers, and we have some members from that group on our panel today. And also a big thank you to our sponsors, the Three Little Bird events, who provided the chairs, because this space had no chairs. <laughs> you need chairs, right? Um, the things we have to think of when we make these things. Um, John Paul Mitchell Systems, who gave us some gifts for our novel, um, and cosmetics. Uh, one of my rockstar guitars, Lisa Johnson, who's here, and she also is a great supporter of the Women's International Music Network and gave us some of her items for the raffle as well. Um, Casio, Martin Guitars, um, Sennheiser, Fender, Tannenbaum Chiropractic. You'll see some of those gifts up there, and we also are. Um, hosting another event tomorrow uh, at Live House. It's part of the Ask App Expo. It's a showcase of like amazing female talent. And if you guys want to come, we also have a sign up on our website to be on the guest list for that. Um, and then we have like these fantastic food sponsors: um, Stonefire Grill, Elena's Greek Yogurt, um, Pink Water, Hit Peas, Luna Bars, and I. I can't read the word sponsor because it got covered up in my document. Is Bonnie here? Yeah. Tell me who the wine sponsor is. Uh, Gill Family Estates. Gill Family Estates. And we had some of this wine and it was really good. Just kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, not tonight. We haven't talked about you tonight, but we'll have it with you later. Um, otherwise, yes, we have we host events like this and we have we're doing a panel on digital Hollywood, you know, all kinds of great and wonderful events. And so now I would like to um, have our panelists introduce themselves and share a little bit about who you are, what you do, and sort of your, your, your sort of place in the industry right now and, and where you're at. So well, you know, let's start with you and just go down the road. And we have to share some microphones. We only have four channels in this video. <laughs> well, my name is Melina Boy. This is so odd because I was recording on this. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. What's the microphone like this? No, is it better than yeah. like this or with the mic? Mic. 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 Mic.
Hi, Mike. Hi. Okay, so um, my name is Melina Boy, and uh, it's so funny because the artist in me comes out and they say, you may never have heard of me, but one of my goals is always when I'm in front of someone is to say that when we leave here, you will remember my name. <laughs> so <laughs> it's Melina Boy, and uh, I'm a singer, songwriter. Uh, I own my own record label, WCE Records. Um, I'm also not very into acting, and I also have a foundation called Drive Hope. And I was like, it's real. And my thing is, uh, I'm a recording artist, came here, 20 bucks, homeless, living on the street, living, washing up the gas stations, trying to make it happen. Cut to years later, I scored my first number one album on Billboard um, last year. And now I've got to a whole other level of different things as an independent artist, which I can't wait to share with you guys <laughs> to tell you how that's all working. And that's just so much. Like an easy guitarist. Like she's an amazing guitarist. I forgot that part. <laughs> and I'm a guitar player. So I said you're a singer, right? But yeah, I'm a guitar player, yes, thank you. Just have a minute. Yes. Hi everyone. My name is Pamela Berga, and um, so I am the manager of diversity and belonging here at Live Nation Entertainment. I've been here for about a year, and it's just been so exciting. It's a very exciting journey. Um, prior to that, I came from a variety of industries, and most recently I was at SpaceX. So I got my MBA. Um, in an undergrad, I actually was, I minored in music. I was supposed to major in music, but just got drawn into social justice, and I felt like that was a uh, true life calling for me, but if you had asked me in college what my ideal job would have been, I mean, I would have said if, if it could somehow integrate music and make right effort by people and help get, uh, make sure that people have equal access to opportunity. Um, I, my career has been an interesting road with a variety of life experiences that I'm grateful for, but along the way a lot of people would ask, well, where's the linear path on that? There's no there stop in. But the, the truth is that follow your, my, my uh, advice is to follow your compass and know your true passion because somehow I wound up in a rolled up lens of all of my passions together. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Bostic and I, you know, it's a little awkward to, for me to talk about myself. It really, you know, it's not quite my thing. Um, a little royal CV, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you except um, I love music, I've been doing it. My mother was teaching piano when her water broke, so I came naturally. <laughs> um, but I have a very diverse and varied background. I started writing my own songs and playing piano at a very young age. I've always loved storytelling, and to me that's, so my journey has been as a sonic storyteller. Um, and I now primarily make my living as a film, TV, and theater composer, but I toured on the road for many years with a number of amazing artists, uh, and, and was also in the studio with people like Ryuji Sakamoto, Daz, Patty Austin, and then I would tour with my own man as a, as a singer-songwriter, and obviously did quite a few um, jazz festivals, but right now the focus has been in the film and TV world as a composer and, you know, to, to also encourage, based on what she was just saying, the, the main thing about life is it's a very, it's just it's your own personal journey and just being true, true to what is making you tick at that moment, that's for me what's got me here today and I'm happy to be here. And uh, I feel like our chairs should all be crooked because we all have these amazingly very wide roads to get to where we where we are at this very moment. Um, I'm a composer, I'm a um, recording artist, I'm a pianist, um, and I've also had a, a kind of a varied road, a non-linear path. Um, when I was very young, I had some, some very cool opportunities to be uh, in a TV show band called the Arsenio Hall Show, which kind of um, launched uh, my life in a way, but it also made, uh, made it take some turns in a, in a very cool way, and I'm glad that I was open to it. Um, and uh, I've, I've been composed primarily also for television and film. Um, I work on some records as well, and I do some piano concerts. And uh, I've also done a lot of movie trailers. I think one of the one of the highlights was James Bond, which was uh, kind of.
of reimagining that theme. And um, I'm very, very excited to say that I have just um, become the president of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, which is an amazing group of women in which Catherine is a member, and I see a lot of members here, um, of just an amazing group of women who are so incredibly talented. And as I, as I get to listen to the music of so many of our members, I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away. And we really are supporting each other, and a lot of wonderful things are changing in, um, in the industry right now, and a lot of doors are opening up. And I'm really committed to continuing the legacy of what the people before me built, and I'm um, really excited about it. Having a severe inferiority complex right now because you guys are so awesome. Um, but yes, in true fashion, um, what I ended up doing today is not what I set out to do. I was a classically trained vocalist until college and then realized, okay, I'm actually not that good, so I'm never going to make any money doing this. So I went back to school and did music business and then. Um, yeah, and did open process innovation, which really means for Universal, when we're getting involved in new areas of business and when we can monetize our repertoire and our uh, IP in different ways, um, our department kind of figures out how we participate in that. So, yeah, I never thought I would be involved in process or in technology, um, but that's what's happened. Um, and then, kind of extracurricularly, um, love being involved with all the women's, uh, institute, oh, sorry, women's uh, international network, um, and I'm also on the board of um, a Little Hope Foundation, which is super cool. So uh, we raise money for scholarships for underprivileged children in the U.S. to try and break that cycle of um, incarceration for minorities. So the idea is that we kind of get ahead of it. We raise money to send. Um, minority children to school so that that kind of cycle is broken. So that's something that I recently got involved in, super passionate about, it's really um, feels good to be involved, it feels like it's a bigger picture thing, which is kind of similar to the, you know, the feeling of doing events like this. It's like, how are we trying to change how we, how people perceive things and how people operate. Um, and then doing a lot of work with Universal as well, with the Women's Network, with the Universal and with the Diversity Programme. So. Really trying to do my part. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Emily Simich, and I am a concert promoter with One Nation. My responsibilities include the booking and promoting of Latin content. And I began my career at Universal Studios Hollywood in the advertising department. And I began working on local events, special events, radio station. Uh, for the opening of the attraction, that kind of jobs came on, whatever we opened new. And then began really doing the work with the Spanish conversations, um, Native, Latina, and my mom's Mexican, my dad, Puerto Rican, um, from Los Angeles. So I really knew the infrastructure and the, the formats of music and reaching out to that consumer. And, and we really saw the foresight of the years down with the demographic growth, the Hispanic market in Los Angeles. And, and really was able to work on the Spanish language tours with the theme park and go from you know, tram, one tram on Sunday to you know, maybe six trams on the weekend and then Monday to Friday. So as, as the um, concert facility in the University of Theater grew, I was invited to be a booker and a promoter at the concert after um, after closing down the level on the freeway for the Yachty Festival that we did with the long set. <laughs> So from there, it was really just um, you know working with artists international in the Latin field and and going into now uh, joining my nation uh, 12 years ago after they you know purchased our conference sort of division with House Blues and just right, finding the right venue for the right artists and the right size so we moved from the House of Blues and go into the Welch Turn, into the Dolby, and on the Palladium. Degree Theater, the Forum, Honda Center, Staples, Microsoft. So we book whatever we can to continue to build the music. So I appreciate you inviting to this day. Thank you. So um, here's our first question. What's been 
one of your biggest surprises in your career, and looking back, what's, what's your view of how you reacted to it at the time, and maybe how you look at it now? Does anyone have something to contribute? Um, I, I don't know if this is really what exactly you were looking for, but I remember, um, so, so there's this common, um, you know, recognized reality that when women are in a room with men, we kind of often get overlooked and our voices aren't heard. And I just remember being in a meeting with two men who I'm really close friends with, and they started doing that to me. And I was just so surprised that it was so true to the extent that my own personal friends would, would operate that way. Um, and I was pissed, like that was my reaction. I was just pissed. I probably didn't handle it very well. I, if I look back, I have got a bit of an explosive tempo, but um, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, just the fact that that, that happened. Um, and I've always been really lucky, actually, my old boss is here, there's an awesome woman there. Um, I've always been super lucky to be um, around really strong women in, in my professional environment. So I've always been really shielded from crap like that. So when it happens, I'm always like, wait, this is seriously happening? Does this happen? Like, I thought this was just hearsay. So that was a surprise to me, and it's like a sad surprise. I don't know if you were looking for something happy. <laughs> Um, when I was out um, of high school, I went to performing arts high school in Michigan. Um, although I'm from Los Angeles, but I went to Interlochen for a year, and it, it kind of um, it was just kind of had this kind of feeling like just music and art, everything was just kind of oozing through the halls. And anyway, I got home and I was practicing the piano, and kind of wondering what I was going to do, and I got a random call from somebody who I never found out who, who gave me their number, and it was a producer on the show called Fame. And they said, we're looking for a on-camera synthesis and somebody who can um, you know, play some of the live recordings, and I guess there weren't very many women around. And so they heard that I played, and anyway, the producer said, you know, I just have one question for you. Um, do you think that anybody would believe that a girl can play keyboards? <laughs> And it's kind of funny because I was literally sitting in front of my keyboard as, as he was saying this, you know, and I said, yes, I do believe that somebody would believe that. <laughs> I do believe. But, you know, it was one of those things that was, uh, it was kind of a, a life-changing thing because even though I, I worked on the show for a couple of years um, playing to some camera and with their live, uh, their live band, but I also started writing music. And it's just so funny that uh, you know I wrote some some pieces of music for that show, and I, I started thinking you know I really like writing writing music as well as playing, and, and it's just funny how just randomly a, a call would change the course of your life, you know, and get get the love of, of a new kind of discipline in you, and so that was kind of a surprise in a cool way. Yeah, I would say from my own perspective, you know, I worked for a company in the music industry for 20 years, and I had a role as the marketing manager there, um, and it was amazing. I, I loved working there. I never thought I would leave. Yes, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I ended up leaving the company because of the circumstances. I It changed a lot. It was time for me to go. And, after I left, I started my own company, and I realized that that first job at that company, I let that define me. I had no idea what was inside of me until I went off on my own and said, okay, I'm going to take a leap. Like, let's see where this goes. And from there, I figured out, oh, I could take that leap. Now I can take another leap. And I've been leaping <laughs> for the last 12 years, and it's been an incredible realization for me to see that, man, thank goodness I didn't stay in that, inside that definition of what I thought I needed to be. And it was a real revelation to me to figure out that there was so much more, like, mind-blowing more. <laughs> Anybody else? I think for me, as many, there's just so many stories and incidents, but um, from one perspective, I'd say as a guitarist, as a female guitarist, like now, oh my god, it is so much better than it was like 
maybe six years ago, five years ago, and that's thanks to you, Laura. Like, I mean, she was the first one that um, literally, I remember Guitar World to feature many women, and then I saw other women, well, just women in general, who were actually playing the electric guitar. For me, I, I'm a woman. The other thing about me is I'm actually left-handed. So I actually take the guitar and I flip it upside down. So I would, I'm like the person that, if someone didn't know who I was, it would, like, it never fails. Like you're on stage and they'll have um, the band, and they'll totally play up the, turn up the, the guy, the guitar player, doing the lead, thinking he's the lead player. And I'm saying, it's me. I'm the girl. I, I'm playing the lead right now. And he's like, no, we're kind of going to hit it. And he's like, yo, it's her. So that was always, like, the craziest But um, that was, you know, one incident. Another incident I'd say is, um, as an independent artist, we all have to go raise money. We all are looking for, you know, uh, capital is what it takes to make anything work. I don't care what anybody tells you, you need capital. And what's so great about now is, yeah, we have many social portals that will help you to raise money. And um, for me, I wanted to look at something in a different respect. We thought, my fiance also does films, and he does PPM. So we put together a PPM, and um, the goal was to raise at least a half a million dollars from the Can you tell us what's a PPM? Oh, it helps you. It's, it's pretty much like, I mean, let's talk about it. So pretty much it's, it's uh, if you, it, it, it's, it, you could, okay. Let me say something. <laughs> so you have, uh, let's say you, you have your uh, record. Right? So what you can do is all it takes. I don't want to get trouble case my is So so basically it, it's a you can have an LLC and with your LLC you can you can break it off into different um, you can sell them off into shares. So for instance, if you look at let's say a hundred thousand dollars, let's say something like that, you can then um, sell off each year share for ten thousand, but it specifically can go towards the record rather than the full um, album. And what the PPM is, it also has like blue sky laws, and these laws mean anybody that can get money from, they have to be above a certain. Uh, okay. So you're saying it's like it's my share. Sorry, yes. Seven yes. shares of right. So, so can you imagine as a person like myself coming in? Um, it's just it, again, you have the Kickstarters and you which is awesome, and you, and you can make money from this using your fans. And I was looking for like a half a million dollars, so we ended up raising the money. And you know, the, the kicker though is, I own the label, and it was just constant where you have the vision of what you want. So for me to sit in a room with guys, it was always where they wanted to have another person that they needed to talk to that looked like them, and not me, because they're like, oh, first, you're a woman. Second, this is a black woman who's saying that she needs, you, you're looking for half a million dollars, and you know, how are we gonna get the money back? And then again, you start talking about the ROI, the return on the investment. So then we start to break down all these different things, which we could do a class and all, all that too, and I would make it. <laughs> but what I'm making is, it's, 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 if people just, my thing is, I just want people to see a different perspective of how difficult it is for women to do certain things and to realize that certain lanes just aren't available just yet. And the only way that you can make certain things happen is you have to stick together. I, I, even though, and, and I'm like, I'll stop talking here, but he yeah, as a guitar player, for me, I am very proud of the community that we have. But there are certain girls where, in my mind, I'm like, look, we need each other. You're missing this whole thing. Because when you have money, money creates opportunities and access that you ordinarily wouldn't have. So you can hire some of the best people, and you'll start to learn the business and understand the way certain things work. And then you'll say, you know what? Certain people will never get to this particular level because they don't have the 30K to spend the Rogers and Cowan or this other particular company. So you're starting to realize you're knocking down doors that other people can't knock down. So it's just a constant battle of trying, I'm sorry, but to, to, to continue. I'm going to hire Melina Boyd to help me finance my next project. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. Don't be sorry. It's all good. <laughs> but the bottom line is you need each other. I can't stress that. Sorry. I can't, you need each other. That's why the guys do so well. So I, I have to add to this because um, you know, I write for Parade Magazine and at one point I interviewed the woman who, I forget what, she, maybe she's head of like music funding for Kickstarter. Um, so I interviewed her because I was going to do a Kickstarter and I was like, maybe I get some insider tips, right? 
And she told me as part of the interview that the one reason why women don't succeed is that they are, won't ask for what they need. And I was kind of blown away by that. I'm like, oh, so men get more funding because they ask and women don't ask. They're afraid to ask. So I was like, Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I just wanted to get some insight into maybe the sort of like personality or characteristics that you think might be important for somebody who does your job, like your career. So if somebody was interested in being a concert promoter, for example, like what do you think is, you know, the thing that makes it like work for you that somebody else might want to? Well, I yeah, am. I actually booked some bands in high school yet. I never would have thought that I would go on to pursue a doing that. But I think it's really, um, I think it is, I was fortunate at university that I uh, spoke Spanish and I had an opportunity to expand on that. And I think it's almost, you know, my parents raised me, I think we speak Spanish, and I'm like, no, we don't need to speak Spanish, we speak English, because that's when we live in the West and all this. But we still, like, we speak Spanish at home. And I really, Started by by asked why you can do so kind of moving with radio stations, moving local groups, and I think just understanding you know, the the P and L's, returns on investment, because you know what you're doing in the company. But I think you have to like in any in any job, I think you have to have faith in yourself, which is the hardest thing for women to do. And really, I mean, I wake up every day, you can breath, and you kind of you know be careful with how you we get a show that's competing against the competitors. And we get the show and we think, oh no, now I'm going to sell tickets because they're really going to sell tickets. <laughs> and we have performance that I have to, our executives have to approve certain levels of, of, of money when they're doing their new shows and state shows. But I think you have to really, everything is really drilled through that and move forward. The only time you need to take risks. And I've had you know, a lot of support from people that are content promoters, and some are going to win and some are not. But I think you, it's like a baseball player. You're not going to succeed by getting one and one run. It's about getting on base, whether you're getting a single or a double. But to me, it doesn't have to be a one run. It's about, about on base percentage. And I think that's what we are. And we just need to continue to have that confidence. And I, you know, booking shows as agencies started contracting Latin artists, they would not want to talk to my, my bosses. They'd say, no, I want to talk to the woman who speaks Spanish that knows the market, and she was going to help see this first, so she could have more artists um, book more dates. But, but similarly to what you're saying, you're not going to be invited to the table. I think that you, when you're invited to a meeting, you need to go to that meeting and you sit at the table. And so many women will sit, they'll see the room filling up, and they'll take this fifth row or the tenth row, and if you're included, you need to go take the chair. And I'm trying to do that now. I'm trying to do my best to mention the young women in my department as they grow in the marketing and taking positions to invite them to say, scoot your chair up. And I, you know, I'm at the level where I can tell my colleagues, move over. Like, move your chair. Because they will not move your chair down. I mean, I, I can say that they move your chair down. And I can move to the table. And, and I encourage, if you haven't read um, Cheryl Sandberg's book from basically her first book, you know, before her husband passed away, is a great book. And the second one is option B, because everybody has to have an option A and an option B. If your option A doesn't work, it doesn't mean you sit back and say, oh no, I lost. You have to look at option B's, just like these performers have a look at. What are the other career paths that you can go into? But just keep knocking on the doors. And if, and you know, the same, one thing that I have two, two boys that I raised, and I would always tell them the same thing. You have to ask for what you want. There's no reason to be here to you. And you ask in a, in a method where you do it off-site, you invite your bosses to coffee or to lunch, and I would tell them the same thing when they play sports, just ask their coach, don't do it in front of teammates, go in early, stay at the practice, and sit down and then ask them what you want. And it's, it's the hardest thing. You know, I would talk to my attorneys or, or advisors, they'd say, no, you have to ask. They say, well, why don't you ask them? No, you have to ask. <laughs> and the only way that they will take you seriously is if you ask. And you know, that's the day that I make sure my hair is washed the way that I want. It. <laughs> I'm wearing my favorite, you know, outfit, and to give you every edge of confidence to make sure that you're doing yourself. And it's okay if they say no. It's okay, but you feel so much better after you walk in the room that you presented yourself 
and giving yourself self-respect to ask what you want, what you think you deserve, and how you get there. So when you go on an interview and you ask someone for you know, what, you, what, you, what you want to do, you want their job. And that's what they want to do. You don't want to be an assistant, or you want to be, you know, you want their job. That's what your goal is, to help grow the company so they can do other things and you can become a natural role. I actually have a question for you all. How many of you are performers? Sweet. How many of you are on the business side? Um, no, I, I think what, what some of the comments have just uh, brought to mind for me, there's a statistic out there that um, oftentimes women will wait and they will see a job description and unless they meet 80% of those qualifications, they will not apply otherwise, whereas men, it's 20%. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's a surprise, but also with them asking for raises and promotions. So if you're on the business side, it's relevant too. Um, one thing that I, um, that I think is, I try to tell my mentees is um, you have to really know your story and be able to tell it because that's how you're marketing yourself. Um, and with that, going into a room and, um, or whether it's a meeting to ask about promotion, whatever it may be, um, you have to be uncomfortable and you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. You have to be unafraid of being afraid. And it's something that it's just, it's a journey, it's going to take time, but that's the real key to success to see things in a, uh, a the long game and not just a short-term strategy. Um, in addition to that, I would say that um, uh, relationship building is really important in this industry. Um, and um, having to having the uh, emotional intelligence, the emotional intelligence to be able to know when you need to sit back and listen. Because oftentimes I believe that the answers are in the questions that you ask people. Um, and then on the other hand, knowing when you need to share more of yourself, when you need to be adding value so that you can um, not just meet someone, but nurture that relationship and um, expand your network because ultimately that is your network. And I was just thinking when Emily was talking to you, like sometimes it is hard to ask for what you want, but you can practice that by asking for little things. And it gets easier to ask for the big things if you practice by asking for a little bit. I totally agree with you because I think there's such a, you can get so overwhelmed with your goals and your aspirations. And I think for me, what I've become more and more aware of is the importance of self esteem. I mean, it, it affects everything. And I think all of us have been talking about it in various ways. And so, the self-esteem piece for me has been in growing much more aware and more comfortable and therefore more authentic. And people sense that right away. You know, even if you're feeling, I had a meeting uh, about a month ago and I was excited about it and, and nervous because it was, you know, the stakes were pretty high. But, but I realized that rather than think about it as this meeting, I just was thinking about it as conversation and that I was there to talk about who I am and what I do. And once I kind of changed that script that, you know, can asphyxiate, you know, as a film composer, we're hired, we're work, we're a work for hire. So we're always auditioning, it's very competitive. You know, you, you know, and if in the back of your mind you're even thinking about, oh my God, this is so competitive and it's so much harder for me, and all this other bullshit to me, it's a lot of noise that distracts you from the essence of why you're there is for me, I'm there because I love making music, period, in a discussion. So that's how I'm gonna show up. And because of that, with this last meeting, I just told them, I said, you guys, you know, look no further. You just need to hire me. <laughs> and I got the job. I got the job. And it was very good. I didn't say it with arrogance or, you know, bravado. I just, we were just we were just like, you know, it was like a good meal. I'm like, yeah, I can cook. <laughs> and so I, I really think that showing up with with that sense of self, you know, Toni Morrison's new book is called Source of Self-Regard. I love I could just, that's the title alone could just be my mantra. And so I really, I want to emphasize that, that self-esteem piece is it's huge. And it's yours. I mean, it's like your birthright, you know, regardless of gender, race, age, all the all the little boxes that people get so confounded. I'm so tired of the box. I can't, I mean, really. 
on my chair to the bird. But truly, when you take that breath first thing in the morning, you, you, you just, ah, oh, okay, here we go. You know? So that's, that's not too sad. I think too, like from my own, my own personal experience, you know, I run a marketing agency that's sort of put my bread and butter, and then I do the Women's International Music Network, and I have a live streaming company I'm a partner in, and I do all these other things. But it does surprise me that I have to be a salesperson, quote unquote salesperson, which I think that idea kind of has like a bad rap, you know, the idea of having to sell something, but I, I often think of it as, you know, I'm providing something valuable, and if I can truly consider what the needs of, you know, my client are, then I'm not trying to sell them something that they don't want to be. I'm, like, helping them reach their goal. So, you know, it's that shift in perspective of thinking of yourself as, like, you know, a value provider. Um, that can often help, um, you know, get you to that next, that next client, that next project, as well. So um, I'm sadly going to talk about now our failures because we talked a little bit about this upstairs and about how sometimes your failures have the most su surprising sort of outcomes as you look back over your life. So can you guys? maybe share some failure that you had and what the, the outcome maybe was in that later in your life? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll say so I start. Okay, because, you know, we all have a lot of failures. I mean, as a composer, I think the way, the, what, what can be perceived as a failure is is you know doing a demo for a job or putting a reel together to try to get a, a film or a TV show and not getting it. But the, the truth is that there's so many people up for everything that, um, that and it's it's so competitive. You know, it's like we're not jumping in the water and saying, well, you know, I just want to twiddle my thumbs for the rest of my life. I, you know, we all do what we do because we love it and it's exciting and it's really fun and it's very fulfilling. And so. It's something that a lot of people want to do. And I think that when um, when I don't get a job, what I've learned mostly is um, to not take it personally and to realize that creativity is, is you know, all of it is inside of, like somebody else's feeling about me is not, doesn't define me at all. And um, and it also, when, another thing I've learned is to just, I'm continuing to learn, is just to not hold on to stuff and to move on because there's, you know, just like that breath, in that, that morning breath, that's a new fresh breath every day. And um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, I don't even like the word failure because, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just another opportunity to do something, to do something else, you know. You know, I would kind of, I'm thinking about failure, it's always going to be a little bit, but in, in my career, I think there was one time that I canceled a concert, because there were so many tickets, and we had a lawsuit, we had a deal, and, and I think, and then with the age of mine, I became a little bit friends and and I learned from that day that I would never, I would not be the one to cancel a concert. And I think because, number one, you lose your advertising dollars, and you lose the opportunity of that artist performing to people. And so it's always, for me, about renegotiating a deal. And because I think that every artist has value, it's about making the right deal, if there's an appropriate venue for the right artist. And so I'll always go with nature, too, and just say, look, if, if, you know, when you when you book an artist, we anticipate they're going to do socials, they're going to have an album, they're out on the tour cycle, and we have history, we have history, we've seen what they've done in charts, we've seen the past career um, concerts, so it's really about you, you know, and for those of you who are performers, when you start going into different size venues, it's about making sure that you know the deal that your representative is sharing on information. Because I'll say that to an agent, it's my responsibility as a promoter to not just deal solely with an agent, but to make sure I'm also talking to the managers, that the manager is seeing the artwork, seeing the ad plan, 
And so if the show's not doing well, I don't want to tell them, you know, for me to put a show, oh, there's a ticket, and I can communicate with them throughout the interim of four months, five months beyond sale through the show date. And it's really about you know, how we keep the show going, even if it's not selling well, and making them feel as important as the artist that's selling the stadium. An artist that's selling a 500 person club or a 3,000 capacity club is just as important to me as someone that would take on a tour during 50 days. So it's it's not really, it, it shouldn't be a failure. You know, we, um, we eight years ago closed the Universal Land Theater. And when the Universal Land Theater closed, you know, I was one of the, the, the primary workers in the building because we had done so many Latin shows before Staples was built, before Microsoft built, the Universal Land Theater Greek Theater with the Korean So when the studio retained the property for Harry Potter, we just heard so much you know, negative responses from the public, and people said, what are you going to do? Now I have to go downtown. And it was all, you know, like people just trying to go back. And I didn't feel bad for me because I had to come from the her back saying to her other than the book. It was really mean and <coughs> so bad for the employees, the ushers, the night cleaners, because a lot of the staff there who come to my shows, the Hispanic shows, were the staff, the labor force, you know, who were the night cleaners, who were the ushers, who were the security, who were they who were booking newer shows. And I just told them, we're going to go on. It's not about looking back, it's moving forward to new opportunities, new venues, booking shows that kind of venues that were never existing. And to this day, I still, wherever I'm at, whether it be feeder, the former staples, you know, man who's an artist, they have the biggest man who is the best paying of any concert venue in Los Angeles. But there's just other doors that opened up, and I got to do stadiums and arenas and then that But there's always something else. It's just you always have an option. You have to look at that yourself. You take those deep breaths and look at yourself and just say, you know, life goes on. And, we, and for those, you know, for, for at least one line, we believe this. You know, we're daughters, we're mothers, we're sisters, you know, we are parents. And we, you know, we work and we try to balance everything. And we, you know, we do a really good job of it. And we have to take time in the present and worry about today, not what's happening in six months down the road. Enjoy your day. But we, but we can do it. And we have the strength to do it to carry on. You know? And I have a wonderful husband who, who will you know, take on responsibilities about how you can show some shopping. And it's like, you didn't buy the tie. I used to, you know, why I'm is it's not the kind of thing I like. <laughs> It's not a certain one. And you kind of have to realize, okay, that is just not important. Just buy what you want. Buy those and worry about what's important to you. I was, first of all, I just want to say, I absolutely love it. Like, her energy is just, like, amazing. And as an artist, like, you just answer one of the questions that no matter what, I'm always like, God, you got something to you. You know, you, but it's to hear you say, um, you just want to make sure it's all good. This is awesome. Like, you, you, this is a whole other conversation with you. You're wrong. <laughs> and we want you to perform. Like, and how do you want to perform? Yeah, and then you're like, brother, it's everything. 500 seats or 50,000. Yeah, every, that is, which is a whole other subject again, which brings me to I and you know, this can't be anything because that's that's what it is. So the people see you and they can matter. But um, this is what I would say to you guys about failure. I've had so many failures that it's negative. I mean, I was just like, you know, I started to get things. I was like, I got that. So this is what I would say to you. I hope you go out there and I hope that you embrace every failure that happens to you. That is what I call your season. It's like you're, if you look at certain things that we have meat, it's, it's okay. When you put that certain thing on it or that certain sauce or pepper, that's when you start to create something that is so unique and so different and so cool. You will need everything that's happened to you in your life, every failure that has happened as you go through your journey. I always look at it as these are little references that you get to go back to so that you can say, you know what, I actually remember this. And I now know how to handle this because of how this happened. And it's not going to be that bad. And it's too fast. But it breaks all those things. And my dad always says this to me. Melina, opportunity has a slick way of coming through the back door that is often described as temporary defeat or misfortune. Perhaps this is why so many film right now is opportunity. I remember, again, when the whole Cirque du Soleil thing was happening, and they had called me to come in and play the guitar for the Michael Jackson, Virgil Gates called, I was like, oh my god, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. 
something happened where it didn't work out, and I was like, oh my God. You don't understand. I wanted this position. I was like, I wanted this. But what I didn't realize is that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because three months later, I got that half a million dollars. And I was able to fund my label, and I was able to start my record, and I was able to put myself in a place to understand what, who I was, what I wanted to be. I was able to hire people, and I remember saying, God, thank you so much. I did not know. I, I didn't know. I, I, I was oh, furious, but it was the best thing. <laughs> well, I'm with you because, you know, if I had my way when I was 17, I should be a rock star. <laughs> But, um, you know, I work for a company I mentioned before, and at one point, my boss, who I had worked for for like 18 years, um, decided to leave the company. And I was like, oh, well, he was the director and I was the manager under him. And I'm like, well, I should logically like apply to become the director. And what was also going on, there was a lot of changes going on in the company, but I also had just been in a car accident. Uh, which I was recovering from, and from the car accident, I found out that I had cancer. So I'm going through physical therapy from the car accident and surgery for the cancer. But I'm like, man, if I don't apply for this director job, like, I'm going to some other director, and like, I'll never get my chance to be the director. So I applied to be the director, and I interviewed with people that I had known for 18 years, like, literally. Um, and I didn't, they didn't hire me to be the director. And I was like, oh really, who are you going to bring in to be the director then? And they hired a, a guy who didn't know anything about being a marketing director and would always look at me, what do you think, Laura? And after about a year of that, I, I was pretty devastated. And uh, I ended up leaving the company and that's when I started my Marketing it was really hard. Um, it took me a couple of years to get into the swing of that. Um, but then that's when I founded the Women's International Music Network and started doing my music again and moved to the other side of the country and blossomed into a million other things. And I realized like things happen and you don't like it, and you don't die. <laughs> Really enabled me to try a lot of stuff, and a lot of it works. And when it doesn't work, you don't die. Some of it really sucks, but you don't die. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> for the most part, I mean, it's right, you just gotta have a different perspective, right? There's always another door. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, have you had challenges as a woman in your career? Can you share? something, a story that happened to you as a woman, or perhaps a woman that you talked to, and you know, what was your reaction, and how, how can you handle some of those things that happen as a woman, music, etc. Sorry. So, so go believe you, don't be sorry. <laughs> so, again, an incident took place for me, where I felt that um, this wasn't represented in the proper way. And it, it really affected me in a way that I, I just felt this person didn't clearly make me, I should say this, they made me feel like I didn't matter, I didn't count. So what I decided to do is that really was the basis of me writing that record, I am young. I started to look at, this person doesn't um, look at or see me in the value that I see for myself, and that's okay. And then I realized those people will never understand that because they come in front of another call, and that's fine. So I figured I was gonna take back my power, and I started writing this record system. And this, for me, I always just felt that no matter what happens, people have to celebrate, you have to celebrate yourself. You have to understand that you matter and that you count, no matter what. People are designed to put their fears, their baggage on you, and then it makes you start to doubt whatever you're trying to do. So, in my moment, I just thought, if this record, and I don't want to tell you, if this record uh, was to come out 
and would, you, would do big things, maybe this person would hear it. And maybe they would rethink how they're looking at their platform. And then it dawned on me that maybe they would be themselves didn't realize that they were possibly being a little racist. And then I realized sometimes people are just built a certain way. And then I myself just said, hey, I'm going to just move forward with this situation. And I came up with this I am enough. And in my moment, for me, I looked at I'm celebrating who I am right now. Not who I'm trying to be. Not who other people think I should be. But the person I am. Because I'm somebody. <laughs> and I think we all somebody. So that, that's, how, that's how that came out. And one other thing for me is like, um, I remember I was in France on so this press tour. And I was this is guitarist magazine, uh, good magazine, French magazine, playing, uh, I was playing, talking to the guy, and I said, hey, we spoke for two hours. And I said, listen, do you get a lot of ladies that read this magazine? And he's like, honestly, no, not, not really. And I said, well, can you do me a favor? I said, if you can't put my name on the front of this, don't even worry about that. You can take it all out. He looked at me and said, no, so like, I just here for two hours. I said, this is the same to me. My publicist then called me, and then she said, hey, did you ever see the cover I, that I sent you? And I said, no. And she said, well, whatever you sent to the guy, he decided to make you the entire cover of the <laughs> And he said that, please tell Melina that I am going to also, every issue, I'm going to make sure that we at least get five women to come in. Yeah. And I said, that's what I'm going There's so much right now, so many stories like this. Um, and I'm sure you know, a lot of you guys go out to Europe and, and the Netherlands for me. It was another thing where I was doing maybe 10 or 12 different countries and I remember the guy said to me, how many, how many women have you interviewed with? And I said, oh my God, God. none. <laughs> but what disturbed me was that seemed normal. Yeah. It seemed normal. I did not realize <laughs> that I had not spoken to a woman and all, it was all men. And I thought, wow. So then once again, I called my phone, so I said, listen, this guy just falls something to my attention, because this ain't normal. I'm sitting here doing, I don't know, like, I can't tell you how many interviews and how many different countries. And that's crazy, there's not a woman. And then he found this woman. And then I heard her story, and then once again, it made me realize, there are a lot of changes. They're happening, but I'm telling you, as a person that firsthand goes over and sees so many things, we all have to just to just chip away and do a piece, and that's why I'm always saying to people, take five more people. If you get a job and it's something you want, you get five more to go. That's how you do it. Because those five more to go, those other five. That, that's, that's my whole thing. That's what I do. So. I like that. Yeah. 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 I think it adds to what my perspective, my story, what my advice to you too. I, um, for me, my identity is intersectional, so I am a woman, I am a Latina woman. I feel like they're inseparable sometimes. Um, the feeling of being alone in a room is something that I've had experience in for since my AP classes in high school to a business school at the USC Marshall School of Business. I was the only Latina out of 220 students. look at data and reports that are now, just now, I think, starting to emerge around the entertainment industry and music specifically. The USC um, and for the Inclusion Initiative came out with a report recently that showed that the 600 most popular songs from 2012 to 2017, um, about 20% were female artists, I think like about 12% were about that, were uh, songwriters. And so it, it's, it keeps coming back to representation, right? Uh, there, it, that's fundamentally where it starts, then the event beyond that is the sense of belonging in a community and a tribe but um yes and i there's a lot more uh this really interesting publications that are coming out to speak to actually what you were talking about with the power of the wolf pack and look at the organizations that are here with the alliance for female composers and the international women's network these are examples of where um bringing people together bring women together so that we can bring five uh people to the table next time we're in a meeting um and we can really help to mentor one another because that's how it how the cycle breaks. Yeah. Um, I, what I find really challenging is when women, and to be honest, I find that in, in my environment it tends to be senior uh, women who don't support other women. Like they believe in the finite pie, which is 
Well, if you have responsibilities and if you get some of the attention, there's less for me. And that, to me, is massively challenging because if I'm not going to be supported by a woman, then who am I going to be supported by? Right? So one story I have, I'll keep all the names out of it because it's a big film. Okay. <laughs> so I was created directing a photo shoot with some top tier um, producers. And there were three male producers, um, which I, I, you know, like you said, I didn't even realize it until, you know, someone mentioned about it all then. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the, the second thing is, you know, a, a senior female that was in the environment too was saying, well, I want to be in the, in the picture too. I want to be on the cover of this magazine. And the whole um, concept was uh, play on a normal Rockwell painting. So the idea was that they were all sitting down to a breakfast table, and instead of food and drinks, we used like studio equipment. Um, and so the female executive was saying, well, I, I'm going to be the waitress who's serving the men. And it just, just kind of blew my mind that that's what her mind went. She didn't see anything wrong with it. The fact that it was three men who were sitting at the table, that she was going to be the subservient character in this really kind of iconic image. And so I just didn't allow it to happen. I kind of, you know, got all my courage up and I said, actually, I don't think that's the best image to be portraying. So I kind of fought for her to get a seat at the table too. So hopefully, maybe she's thinking, okay, yeah, you know, kind of changed her mindset too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at this point, I think we're gonna um, open it up a bit if you guys have some questions, and maybe you can come forward so that we can hear you better because it's hard to hear us without that. So yes, come on up. <laughs> thank you all so much. I love John, you. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I've been calling that all the wisdom. Um, hi, I'm Angelique. Uh, I'm an artist producer. Uh, don't get me started on being the only female engineer in the room. Uh, I have <laughs> I have taken up the practice of getting rid of the word sorry, especially when I'm in the control room. I've also tried to eliminate, you know, just from my emails. Like, I just because I realized, oh, you're making it like really small when you're saying just. So I was wondering if you had any other um, practical tips or phrases to get rid of, or maybe something to add. Um, how do we confidently conduct ourselves in the day to day things? Thank you. I mean, I actually write my email and then I read and then I edit it because I do that. I say just, and I don't say sorry anymore, but I. <laughs> But I, I put soft language in there, so I actually read everything that I write before I send it out. Because I don't want people to do anything. But does anybody have uh, any other thoughts on practices to portray strength? Also, if you remove the word, but from the said it's just, but it's just, I think it just needs to be proactive of what you're going to do. Right? And, and, and if something if something happens that doesn't work good in the paper, it's it's really presenting what are you going to do next? Like how are you going to move forward? You know, if, if you if something doesn't turn out the way you want, or like, whether the show isn't doing as well as you wanted, whether it's going to appear, what's the next step? Okay, you're, you're walking forward. So the next step is what I've learned in this example, and this is how we're going to proceed, and this is going to be the next step. Yeah, and I would also say like I have a lot, I've had a lot of interns work for me over the years, and, and other people work for me. And I find the best thing like you are gonna screw up, people screw up, things happen. But if you can go back to your boss or whoever you're working with and say like this thing happened, but here's what I think we should do next, like come with the solution while you're taking ownership of the thing that went wrong. And I just love that. I'm like, nobody's perfect. Like, people, things happen, people screw up, but at least if you can say, okay, this thing happened, but here's what I think we need to do, or can we talk about, like, some possible solutions for this, and just, like, be that person to go forward. I think that, to me, is so mature and amazing in anybody. Yeah, not, yeah, not hiding anything in the carpet. I think, I think you only grow by, by your not being anything with the party, just an exactly that. Just, no one's going to criticize you when you admit that you learned from it. Maybe. Especially like when you wait to tell somebody that you did something wrong, then it becomes their emergency later, and that's just the worst. Like, that just happened to me this week, so. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, not many other days for that. One other thing that's kind of, uh, I think is really important is when you think of something to do it. 
you know, like especially if you're if you say, oh, I'm going to answer that email later, or I'm going to follow up on that next week. Um, you know, sometimes it's easy to put stuff off because you're kind of uncomfortable about doing it. Um, and I would just say that it's just really important to just if you think if you think you're going to answer an email or you think you're going to give somebody a call or do something to just take the time and just try to try to do it right then. And I totally agree about the but. And I totally agree about Jess. <laughs> I'm always backspacing my emails and rewriting them too. And I wanted to say that for me, I think it's important to, let, to give yourself permission to stretch outside of your comfort zone. So that, that process that makes you feel a little awkward or sea lady, that's part of the growth that you're actually gifting yourself with to enable the progress and the success that you're intrinsically seeking. So I would say not to, you know, I, I'm not saying it's easy. I, I'm a very sensitive person and I'm always, you know, witnessing this weird conversation in my head about, well, you know, two steps forward. Three. And then finally, I just, one day, I, I just try to take a moment in that day to watch even that and watch how I'm, as a friend of mine, She's a captain yourself mutilated. What the hell is wrong with you? And that imagery was so strong that I said, yeah, let me just, just stop that. So just you know, allow yourself that space to to I don't like to say make a mistake. I mean, just you we're, we're all growing, you know. I mean and, and life is such a it's such a fleeting passage of time. Not in a way that should be fear based. I mean it's a gift. So that moment-to-moment -moment process, while things are unfolding, you know, that's, that right there has so much wisdom and, and, and uh, alignment for you. So I just would say respect that process. That's what I would say. I would say if you You should go for it because otherwise somebody else is going to do it, and then you're going to feel like you know someone kind of took your your win away from you. So I, I would say be aggressive in those in terms of that because men would never say I can't do that, I can't get a cheat day on my skill set. So that's something I always try and do, even if it's something super far fetched and it's not in the day to day realm of, of my job. Um, so one of the lessons that I learned right out of grad school I felt was so important um, was about communication style. So be very self-aware about your natural default. Um, there are behavioral tests like this, I don't know how experience most people know. Um, but just understand like what your what your default style is and recognize what other people are. So that was a mistake I did make certainly very early on in my career postgraduate school where I was just kind of I just wanted to get things done, crossing things off the list, and um, forgetting that some people are um, approach things differently. They want maybe more data. So, some of them may want more data. Some of them might be more relationship oriented, and they need that report. They need to know how your weekend was, and they want to tell you about theirs. Other people might be, um, you know, just as kind of direct as I am. So, but now having that top of mind has just um, changed a lot of the um, working relationships um, and products that we. That I think can also translate to um, confidence in your feedback. And I want to say, like, I actually took a, like, a, a American Management Association workshop on negotiating at one point in my career. And one thing that the one takeaway I guess that I had was this idea of not renegotiating with your staff. Like, you, when you already have that conversation, well, maybe I don't need to ask for that much money. And you're like, maybe that, you know, maybe I should. Like, you're never going to get what you want if you don't at least ask for what you want. And, you know, it doesn't have to be about money, it can be about anything. And so I always have that voice in the back of my head, don't you negotiate with yourself. Like, don't use that soft language, like, say what you want, you know. So. It's not about Yes, it's not it's always about money, it's about what is more convenient to get your job done. If you know that there's a, whether it's hiring freeze, or you need to cut back and, and travel, or you need to cut back and certain things. But what's going to help you, whether you need a computer, whether you need a laptop, a slide you're going to take home, whether you need, you know, you're not feeling that we can need a parking space for you, something that things that are going to make it convenient for you, or you need more help, or you need to share a system. Those are things that the companies can provide. And, and one optimistic uh, decision I made a few years back was, 
I made my Monday my favorite day of the week. Because <laughs> I felt like when I do Sunday nights, I think I always thought, no, Monday's going to be the best day of the week. It's the new start of the week. And then Monday's over, and it's Tuesday, and it goes down hill. So rather than always wait until Friday where we wish our life away, I always think Monday is my day to learn something new and get challenged. And by the time I know 